gin has been Britain's drink of choice since the 1700s. It's been called Mother's Ruin. <laughs> now, thanks to some crappy distillers, a new gin craze Your is buzzing watching. across the pond. Charlie Daggett shows us this juniper revolution. Confession later. Yeah. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, this joint's hosting London's first ever gin festival, and it's a sellout. Do you like rhubarb or elderflower? It's no surprise to Olivia Williams. It tastes kind of foofy and sounds foofy and sweet. She wrote the book on it, Gin, Glorious Gin. No matter I was just about drinking age before she was born, make mine a double. I, I don't know how much I should put in. You're a young girl, you shouldn't be an expert on gin. You should be a ruddy-nosed old man like me. I'm sure the gin will take its toll. <laughs> Gin taking its toll is a lot of what her book is about, and we'll get to its CD past in a moment. But it's clawed its way back up to the point where there are currently around 200 types of gin on the shelf, with a whole new breed of distillers. And at the forefront of that breed, the effervescent Sam Galsworthy and his Sipsmith gin. Sipsmith was able to be the very first distillery to launch in London since Beef Eater in 1823, and we were hugely proud of that. And just as proud of the Sipsmith back to basics approach. This is all man, this is all real hand, real passion and experience, skill. And I think Americans call it craft, and quite rightly so, because mm -hmm. I think there is a huge amount of energy and passion and attention to detail that goes into craft, of which the Americans know very well about. How much of that is theater and how much of it is craft? Absolutely every single bit of it is real because, you know, here at Sipsmith, what we make uh, in, in one year, the big guys, mm -hmm. like Tanqueray or someone, make in a morning. And although so Sam's cup clearly runneth turns, over with enthusiasm, his convinced. distillery's limited uh, output uh, raised a problem when it came to getting past Britain's strict laws concerning the amount of gin you must produce to get a license. The amount of gin you were making was closer to moonshine. Well, yes, it was. I mean, you know, we were making 300 bottles at a batch a day. I mean, that is absolutely nothing. Cheers. Now, that limited supply has to meet a rising demand from discerning palates here and in the U.S. It really is all about the fine-tuning. It really is about there are all sorts of different things that influence this. The smallest alteration uh, of injection of steam or, or, or the reduction in temperature here or even the flow of water um, in anywhere in the system. Too much juniper, you know, too little water. You know, there are all sorts of different aspects and elements of this that need to be controlled to the nth degree because it will influence the flavors incredibly. And while he says gin might be in fashion, it would be wrong to suggest it's a fashion statement. It's, it still has kind of an image problem, you know, to a lot of people. Yeah. Gin is for posh people like yourself. Is, is, that, is that rhetorical? Is, is, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> But it wasn't always so. The satirist William Hogarth's famous etching from the 1750s depicted the evils of a gin epidemic. A drunken mother carelessly lets her baby slip out of her arms. It was the first time that spirits had been widely available uh, so cheaply, and people were getting really, really drunk for the first time, and it created a social crisis as well as a health crisis. Ironically, it was another health crisis that helped gin survive it all. This garden near the Thames has stood since 1673. You may wonder what an ancient collection of plants and trees has to do with gin. Unless the tree you're talking about is one of these, which turned gin from a life taker into a life saver. This is the chinchona tree, and inside its bark they found quinine, which helped protect British forces in far-flung places from malaria. It was given to soldiers in something they called tonic water, which was still hard to stomach. But add a little gin, and you've got a cure and a classic. Both hero and villain, gin's rich history has the makings of a classic like the G&T itself. From the bottom of the bottle to class in a glass. Cheers. For CBS This Morning, I'm Charlie Daggett in London. Glass in a glass. What does he mean, guys, when he says it tastes foofy? I don't know. In the beginning. I don't know, but why did you stop? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I think I just had one too many back in the 90s. Yeah. Wouldn't you love to have been there? Yes. <laughs> I That's would what, like to see. That, we were talking about nostalgia for the 90s, guys. You missed it. Going it's a wild good decade. and crazy. I'd pay to see that. <laughs>